Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes as always and today I'm here for a second time with Dr. Guy Madison. He's professor at the Department of Psychology at the University, at University of Umea, Sweden. Dr. Madison does research in neuroscience, genetics and evolutionary biology. And today we're going to focus on a different topic. We're going to talk about gender, gender studies, a little bit about the politics of gender and related topics. So, Dr. Madison, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, Ricardo. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. So, uh, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, gender studies, because uh, there's been this debate around, at least in some academic circles, uh, gender studies have been questioned by people from uh, harder, let's say, social sciences like psychology, anthropology, sociology and so on as being uh, weaker uh, when it comes to, uh, to their science. I mean, they ask if they are really scientific or not. And I know that you published something uh, exactly addressing that question. So could, could, you, could you tell us if really gender studies are scientific, if they are just, just somewhat scientific, or if there are uh, some of them that are scientific and not the others? I mean, uh, how does it go exactly? Well, I suppose many people would <clears throat> feel that uh, the question of be something being scientific or not is a difficult one in and of itself. I, I will not try to obfuscate the question. I think it's a very interesting question. But I must say that gender studies is not really um, a discipline. It's uh, unlike physics or psychology or so, gender studies doesn't have a particular subject matter. It doesn't even have a particular set of methods or anything like that. But rather, um, <clears throat> gender studies prides itself of being interdisciplinary. And uh, the people who to consider themselves, who self-identify as gender studies scholars, they typically come from other disciplines, um, most commonly sociology. It could be history. It could be literature all over the uh, academic map, in fact, uh, and also so uh, from, from psychology, there are people who apply um, this perspective. And that, that is probably how it's best described. So genders, gender studies is possibly best described by um, a perspective. So these scholars, they apply a certain view of the phenomena that they're studying. And that could be, as I say, from even in medicine or, or computer science and so forth. So then, of course, um, you wonder, what is this perspective? Well, it's not exactly easy to say what it is that distinguishes gender studies from other areas of, of academe, so to speak. But uh, we had to look into this because, uh, as you mentioned, we've done a number of studies trying to assess these claims that you mentioned. And we went to the National Encyclopedia, of, uh, the Swedish National Encyclopedia, and found that the definition is somewhat mushy, but it has something to do with um, cons uh, uh, the perspective is that there are power balances or power differences between different groups in society. And <clears throat> particularly when it comes to sex, the uh, premise is that men have more power and influence than women have. And another distinguishing feature is that gender studies apply an intersectional perspective, meaning that this power structure can be extended uh, indefinitely to various group identities. So 
That makes it kind of difficult when we want to empirically uh, compare certain aspects of gender studies and other studies. So how, how could we possibly categorize them into distinct categories when in fact um, a paper in medicine and uh, could have a gender perspective, whereas a, a paper in sociology might not apply a gender perspective. So maybe I should say something about um, what the approach that we took. And um, so it was kind of difficult. We were thinking a great deal about this. Should we perhaps interview different scholars and ask them what they think or how they evaluate a gender perspective versus an, a not a gender perspective? But one problem there is that people probably have, I mean, if, if you're not a gender scholar yourself, you might not be totally aware of what the distinguishing features are. So you might be not be able to say if what it is anyway, to make any kind of evaluation. So what we did was to go to published material. Mm -hmm. And after some while, uh, and I'll tell you a bit about this because it's quite interesting what we uh, found when we sampled the, the literature on gender studies. But uh, eventually we uh, <coughs> excluded all kinds of publications except journal publications, that those that are published in in um, scholarly journals with peer review. So that's what, what we amounted to. So it turns out that <clears throat> some scholars are very profiled in this sense. So they sort of self-identify, I am a gender scholar or I apply a gender perspective to all the research I do. So that was the main criteria that we used. So if the person who had written a certain publication uh, self-identified, then we placed that uh, publication in the gender studies category. Sometimes or many times it's not possible to get this information because you people don't uh, perhaps haven't written about themselves at all. They are just names. Yeah, at a department somewhere. And in that case, we had to read through the uh, the uh, publications. Uh, sometimes it was enough to read the abstract. Sometimes we had to read the entire paper to see if we could find any of these components that apparently distinguish um, gender studies perspective. That is, um, oh, I didn't mention also, a very common feature is the idea that uh, sex is socially constructed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> if they apply this power perspective, if the, uh, if the paper assumes that or discusses the idea that sex is socially constructed and or if it applies this intersectional perspective, then we placed it in the, in the middle category, which we called um, inferred gender. Uh, gender studies perspective. And then finally we had the, the group of uh, articles that had not uh, any gender perspective at all. So that's something about the, um, <clears throat> the way, uh, one approach that you could apply to kind of test these, these claims. I should say also a bit about the background because this is not my area at all, but it, um, you see, in Sweden, uh, the authorities have decided that a gender perspective should uh, permeate all of academe and preferably all of society as well. So there have been very strong um, steering approaches from, from the government to the universities and then that have trickled down from the um, head of or the, yeah, the head of different uh, institutions down to all departments saying that we, we must, as academics, um, how, it is, um, how it is now expressed, we have to consider a gender perspective in everything we do, more or less. So in how we treat students in the classroom, in how we prepare courses, in how we choose the course material and 
throughout the whole academic process, um, there is a, a very strong um, idea that we should apply this perspective that, well, as we've been talking about, uh, men and women might have different power and, and so forth. And so, <clears throat> when we, uh, we were told this as uh, teachers and researchers, many of us were fairly confused. We didn't know how to do this. What exactly does it mean? It wasn't clear from the instructions we got. And so, uh, discussing this amongst ourselves, we um, realized that we, we needed to, to learn more about this whole field. Yeah. And, so it, it, and so it happened that <clears throat> we had some colleagues who are very knowledgeable, uh, and uh, in particular one person who uh, was kind enough to actually uh, make a course. So we were 15, 20 academics who took this course in how to uh, a crash course in gender perspective, so to speak, and um, uh, directed, aimed uh, towards how to uh, practically implement this in, in our um, daily work. So that's uh, the background. And since I am, I am very interested in epistemology and uh, the quality of, of science generally, so I, th I thought this was a, an excellent opportunity to to look further into this. And I can say that some of the things that I took, brought home from this course, was that science as we typically define it, is that it was, it was called positivism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was referred to typical science, the typical application of the scientific method, that of uh, formulating hypotheses uh, from a theory and then testing these hypotheses uh, that was termed as positivism and was framed as being old-fashioned, old-school and um, backwards, uh, sexist uh, and excluding different perspectives and um, that may well be the case so I thought let's look into this a bit uh, further. So after, after completing this course, I um, began thinking of how to actually uh, test the claims that the course was making. As, as I mentioned, there was, there was a whole bunch of other ideas as well, but I mean, it, it would be fascinating um, if there um, emerges a new kind of science that overtakes the old science uh, and uh, that's I mean that's how science progresses generally that uh, the free free inquiry leads to uh, new ideas that are being tested and evaluated and that's what we're in the process of doing simply so uh, would you say that uh, the, the one of the biggest problems with gender studies and even uh, other types of uh, I don't know if we should call them cultural studies or social studies like we also have, particularly in the US, uh, black studies, Hispano studies, we have women's studies, gay studies, I mean, uh, trans studies, all, all sorts of things that, that are part of the same group of things that are politically oriented. So. And I would like to ask you if you think that one of the biggest issues here is that uh, particularly gender studies, that is what we are talking about, uh, is the fact that they are politically oriented, politically motivated, and they also have a political goal. And so that's, that would be one of the reasons why they start off with a particular assumption, like for example, that women are generally discriminated at work, in society, in relationships, in academia, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, it's never a happy combination, is there, of um, ideology and, and science. 
it, it has never worked very well. And uh, in as much as um, that is the case, I mean, I, I think it should generally be, generally be avoided. Uh, but the question is, of course, em empirical. Is it really the case that it leads to uh, poor scientific quality or bad conclusions? And, um, well, that's what we've been investigating to some extent. And um, we, I, I'm sure we'll return to this, but that is sort of the, the take-home message that it's problematic if you have the idea that you should arrive at a certain conclusion when you try to do um, science. So in the first study, we looked at, first of all, we, we did this very thoroughly. We sampled everything there was within a certain time period from the gender studies databases themselves, because there are such databases in Sweden that um, that uh, compile all kinds of studies, even those that may not, not be found in the big databases, um, international ones, uh, like Scopus and, and uh, Web of Science, um, for example, because they contain studies that are written in Swedish and so on. And in a 10-year ten time period, we found 12,000 publications from these databases. So that was the whole population. And from that, we draw a sample of about 1,000 uh, publications and studied um, different properties about those. Uh, so this is, I would say, the first study from that we published in 2015 provides a fairly good overview of some of these uh, let's say, demographic characteristics of gender studies publications. And what uh, one interesting finding is that there are many, or the distribution of different kinds of um, publications is quite different from other fields. So we also um, had a, a comparison sample of non-gender studies. And, you know, there are book chapters, there are edited books, there are dissertations, and uh, and so forth, and finally there there are journal publications. And what we found was that there were between two and five times as many of these non-peer non-peer reviewed publications that were gender studies publications. So book chapters, uh, conference uh, contributions, and so forth. But when it comes to the peer reviewed uh, publications in typical scholarly journals, it was the opposite. It was um, a smaller proportion of those were gender studies. Uh, so it was about 40% um, non-gender studies had 40% more publications in, in journals. We also documented the various disciplines uh, that these scholars came from, and we looked at the publication patterns across this period, and we could see that the proportion, if you look at the whole population of scientific publications in the social sciences, we could see that internationally, gender studies increased its proportion over this 10 peer, uh, year period uh, in Sweden as well as in other Western countries. So those are some, and there is, there's lots more of, of these kinds of different, you know, overall statistical observations. We could also, we looked also at um, the impact in terms of citations, and we found that the number of proportion of, of publications that had zero citations was uh, larger for the gender studies publications than for other the, the publications that did not apply a gender perspective. Now, of course, this could depend on many different, it could have many different causes. Uh, one implication could be that they were somehow of less interest or had a lower quality, but that's not, of course, the only possibility. There could also be, I'm just saying this to be upfront, it could be some kind of discrimination. Perhaps people have a uh, an attitude that uh, this kind of publications are not worth to cite, or perhaps the the body of people who uh, have a reason to cite these studies uh, is less. 
But anyway, these are the empirical observations. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, another question. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that uh, the ideology behind gender studies is permeating some of these kinds of studies and even other social sciences. Uh, is it the case that uh, this ideology that comes from gender studies and the other types of studies that I mentioned that are that operate basically uh, on the same basis uh, are, are also per starting to permeate other areas of knowledge or inquiry, I, I don't know, like uh, biology and other areas, because I, I imagine that if people in gender studies uh, start off with the assumption that there are, uh, there are no uh, there's no biological basis for for the sex differences that it is virtually all socially constructed then uh, the, the ideology could spread to other areas and particularly in biology because people also study uh, sex differences at at different levels of the phenotype, including uh, behavior and psychology, if that's something that is happening, uh, particularly in Sweden, but if you know about what is happening across at least the uh, first world countries, could, could you tell us something about that? Yes, it, it is my impression that these ideas have been spreading and becoming more influential. Uh, in the last few years, uh, several books have been published by academic scholars um, making such claims. And of course, there is no intrinsic uh, conflict between the statement that uh, there is a biological sex and it um, affects us to some extent, and the other idea that social interactions and uh, various, um, as they like to call them, structures might also affect human behavior. In, in fact, I don't think there's anyone that would deny that we are affected by our environment. That would be ridiculous. But the question is, of course, in, in what ways and to what extent, and how important is this? Uh, and here again, we arrive back at the political and ideological basis, or uh, let's say the which is, I think, in many cases, the ultimate motivation for this whole study. I mean, we could, in principle, we could just skip the science and academe and go directly to the political issues that uh, people don't want to feel that they are being, um, that they are being coerced or uh, prohibited in some sense uh, from doing what they like, and also from the more concrete problem that is often raised, that there are different proportions of men and women in many areas of, of society. And, and these differences are, are very, very profound in some areas. As you know, in, in all areas that have to do with caring for other people, in, in medicine now in Sweden, 70% of new physicians are women. Uh, in uh, physiotherapy, it's uh, even greater. In veterinary science, I think the numbers are 95% women. And, um, well, to, to contrast uh, with, uh, with the truck drivers and uh, automotive um, repair people, those who work in, in with repairing cars or computer uh, science departments, where there is a much higher proportion of, of men. And of course, it seems kind of funny to try to explain this with a power structure when it's not clear that the power or the, the status of these different areas are always in favor of the male proportion. I mean, you could speak about an auto mechanic or a garbage collector or a truck driver or uh, occupations with lower status, if anything, and uh, lower uh, salaries as well. 
but still uh, the proportion is more than 95% male. So it, it is difficult to draw home this whole idea, but it is very popular, and as you say, it has been, um, it is becoming a part of the, the cultural basis, the main, the main fabric, so to speak, of our, our thinking and, and attitudes. But um, I think you have been discussing this with, with other people on your show as well, so maybe we shouldn't delve in too much into that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, let's talk a little bit more specifically about Sweden. So I, I know that you did a study where you analyzed Swedish politicians' arguments for sex quotas. So could you tell us about uh, your conclusions and what were specifically the aspects that you studied there? But, because I think that you you compared power and influence with quality and productivity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the thing that inspired me in this case was a statement uh, in, a, in a newspaper from our then Minister of Higher Education making a, a range of uh, claims that men are uh, not more able uh, as a group than women, but yet are to a greater extent uh, selected for the higher positions in, in academe. And that this is because of uh, discrimination of various sorts. So I um, became curious about the uh, underlying logic of all this. And I uh, looked into other such statements. And in fact, in Sweden, we have this uh, long-standing quest from the uh, authorities to increase gender equality in all uh, areas of society. And so I could find documents from 20 years back and more um, that were sporting similar, similar um, arguments. So, for example, there have been several proposals to the to the government that we should um, change different policies in order to increase uh, sex equality, and those are motivated by the same sorts of, of claims that there is this this um, uh, covert discrimination and covert quotas, uh, uh, you might say, where um, females are uh, kept out of the system somehow. And uh, I gathered, I think, four different such texts. And they, they are interesting because they are not opinion pieces from any just, you know, they are not op-eds, they are not from a single person, but they are actually vetted statements from the highest political level uh, in, the, in the Swedish uh, administration. And when I looked at these, read these four different texts together and tried to find what, what they're actually saying, I could locate a few different very distinct themes. And they are that women are at least equally able as men and that is inf can be inferred from the fact that the proportions between the sexes would be equal if the there were no discrimination or no bias. The other statement that you could find is that whatever the business, in this case academe, uh, the scientific quality would increase if we had a higher proportion of, of women. So that would imply logically that not only are the sexes equal, but the female, the women are more uh, competent. Otherwise, the equality would increase if there were more women, right? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, another claim is that men, less able men, are currently recruited to the higher positions. This follows logically from the fact that even today, only 35% of newly appointed professors are women. 
So because of these two logical conclusions, then, um, the, the, the politicians, the, the Minister of Education, want to apply several different pol political measures to increase the proportion of women as, and uh, research grants so that it becomes 50% uh, or very close to 50%. And uh, these measures, whatever they are, they constitute, of course, some kind of quotas by definition because uh, we have a meritocratic system, and if that meritocratic system is working and doing its job, it has to mean that there are fewer uh, males that reach this, f sorry, fewer women that reach the same academic level today. Otherwise, there would be 50% or even 60% women. So, this means that some kind of mechanism that works like a quota in some sense, or at least a systematic bias uh, against men, has to be applied to, uh, to reach 50% representation. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, um, that occurred in these comments is that me uh, females have higher demands. That, that occurs uh, in several of these texts, uh, and, and they, what they are thinking about is the uh, competition and the unsecure um, conditions of employment that academics have, typically um, early on in their career. Uh, just as in, in other countries, uh, there is a tendency for people to uh, try to uh, increase their merits very quickly, uh, change departments, uh, seek uh, higher positions until they uh, eventually uh, get tenure, uh, which is the first really, it could be the first really safe position where you know that you will keep your job for an indefinite period of time. And what the, these political texts say is that women have a harder time accepting this insecurity before they reach a safe position. So somehow they want to uh, improve that situation so that academics can get safe positions earlier on in their career or that larger numbers of people can get safer conditions. Uh, there is also an intim intimation in all of this that the larger if we increase the proportion of women, it would increase the quality of an eminence of Swedish research and increase our um, competition uh, internationally, increase the, uh, the competitive level of Swedish uh, research. But that, of course, um, that, that would only be true if all the other uh, claims are true, that, in fact, there are a lot of women who have, are more able than the currently employed men that could be allowed into the high, highest positions and thereby increase the, the general quality of research. So that's uh, the main messages. But um, there are some problems with, with that <clears throat> chain of arguments because if all of this is correct, then you could improve, then apparently the meritocratic uh, selection system is not working as it should, because then, of course, it would select more women than men. But the interesting thing is that uh, the politicians, uh, they say nothing about the meritocratic system. They don't even mention it, except that it doesn't seem to be working. But if it doesn't work, uh, then an obvious thing to do would be to improve, make sure it works as it, as it would. Because a problem would be that if you, if you apply other kinds of devices, what that might, whatever that might be, that increases uh, the proportion of one group, then that will probably increase um, that in regardless of the uh, individual ability. So if you just increase the number of women, it will be women who are all over the range from very highly competent to less competent. But if you, on the other hand, apply a meritocratic method, 
it would only select the women who are the highest in incompetence. And thereby, applying a bias of this sort that the government is trying to do would logically then not increase the scientific uh, quality as much as if you would increase the meritocratic selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since we are talking about quotas for academic, uh, for academia and academic positions, isn't it the case, I mean, at least I know that this is true for the United States, but in Sweden does it also happen that uh, a majority of college students are women nowadays? I mean, that they outnumber men at least in many areas of knowledge, uh, of many areas of academia. That is correct. Uh, the, the grand average is 60% today mm -hmm. across all disciplines. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but then, of course, we have this uh, very uh, the, the phenomenon that is also often referred to that that women tend to become, um, the proportion of women tends to decrease at higher levels. Mm. That's, that's also a fact that we can see in the statistics. Okay, so, and so as, as you move from, for example, a bachelor's degree to a master's and to a PhD, the proportion of women go, goes down, is that it? Not on those levels, but I was thinking of teachers and researchers, of oh, academics. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. okay, okay. Yeah. So I, I know that the proportion amongst PhDs is very close to 50%. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and, and also actually as lecturers, because what, what is called a professor in the United States, we call um, a lecturer, that is a non-time limited teaching position. And those positions are held to, I think, approximately 50% by women. And that's increasing rapidly because, as you, as you mentioned, the proportion of women is and has been increasing uh, among students. So it's, it's only reasonable then that the proportion of teachers also reflect this. Um, but then, we have the next level is called docent. That would be, uh, um, that's only a, an honorary title in Sweden. It means you have completed uh, something, a research uh, corresponding to about two doctoral theses. Yeah. Docent. Uh, at docent level, I think there are fewer women, and professors are definitely fewer. There's, they're about 25%. Uh, women amongst professors, but the, the competition is very high for the professorships because there are not so many of them, and um, yeah, uh, they are very desirable as well because typically they entail more time for doing research. So people who have a, a who are oriented towards research uh, tend to be very. Um, devoted to, to um, apply to, uh, to, to get themselves a professorship rather than having to teach uh, for about almost all of their uh, working time, as you do as a lecturer. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly in, in the several different levels of studies in higher education, I mean, bachelor's degrees, master's, PhDs, and so on, if it happens that uh, in some of them at least uh, men, uh, men stand in a lower proportion. I mean, there's a lower proportion of men occupying positions in those kinds of, in different kinds of degrees. I mean, if people, when it happens to women that they are fewer in number, worry about that and they say immediately that there's some sort of discrimination going around there. I mean, shouldn't we also care about men when it goes 
the other way around. That seems kind of obvious, but I suppose that the the reason why we don't do that generally is this power perspective that is put on all of this reasoning that uh, even though it may be the, it might be the case that there are fewer men in some areas uh, men are assumed to hold higher power uh, as a, as a group total i mean we can see that there are of course men who who are extremely poor and uh, do extremely poorly in in all kinds of, of respects but that doesn't in in the view of these people that doesn't of course uh, deny the fact that there is a, a general hierarchy where, where men are at the top and i'm you can you can imagine that if you have this very strong view that you know, you know, all CEOs, all leading politicians, and so are men. Uh, there is some kind of power structure there uh, that shows that if m men are um, do do poorly in some areas, it's uh, just a uh, an exception or or a fluke, or maybe it's just simply because men aren't so interested, or that some area has lower status and is therefore not that attractive to men mm -hmm. if the if the um, if the uh, reasoning the assumption is always that men are striving for the higher status positions so it is a very large and and well i wouldn't say complex but uh, it's a huge theory um, of sorts that has a very uh, large influence over people's thinking. And as you alluded to before, it has been spreading quite a lot in society. And I think it, it is my feeling that it is now, it has not been uh, taken seriously that much before. But in the last few years, it has become so prominent and and so um, ever present that more and more people are reacting to it in various ways of course the reaction could be oh this is interesting and oh this this is important good that i learned about it but it could also be that many people feel that it doesn't resonate with their everyday experiences and it doesn't seem to hold water if you look at some of the empirical data and there are also self-contradictions in this, which I show in this um, uh, paper that we were just discussing about the arguments. Because if the if the arguments were really true, different policies would surely be applied. Instead of quotas, instead of favoring one group over the other uh, in many different ways, you would simply make sure that the most competent people were selected. And I, I should say that we have this very, very strong interaction between these ideas and the political level in Sweden, as well as in the academic system in Sweden, where all these work together to spread this perspective and make these things uh, happen and um, we, as, as I document in these three first papers that are about uh, comparing the quality of different publications I, I do do look at uh, the various things that have, have been going on and they have been steering documents published for, for 30 years uh, making very strong claims about these things and arguing very strongly for different measures that we must apply to increase equality. And I also point to the amount of money that's been put into this. Hundreds of millions of, of Swedish crowns have been uh, devoted to uh, exclusively to gender studies uh, centers. Uh, various departments and to various projects 
um, the uh, the governmental reports themselves they list um, hundreds hundreds and hundreds of specific projects that have been devoted to increasing equality in academe so it's a huge operation the scale of this is enormous uh, even for a, a country as small as Sweden and uh, I believe that similar things are going on in the United States at least within the universities and I think that it's it's also spreading to to other countries to a greater extent and it will only be a matter of time before even the the former Eastern East uh, European states uh, will be thinking along these lines I think but as I said just uh, a minute ago or so, um, this huge um, campaign is also um, uh, it's also awakening people to what is going on. Before, I think many people thought, well, this is just a small fringe. Uh, thing that is going on on the edges of academe and, and you know let them have uh, their bit of fun and you know acad academe should be open to all kinds of ideas and that's that's fine and uh, that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been contested that much and, and the claims themselves the theoretical discussions and not least the empirical data have not been scrutinized in an objective fashion and so for example in the in one of the studies I think um, from 2017 where we compare the content of gender studies uh, publications with, with other types of publications we uh, do a literature research and to, to find what has been done before and if we look at um, peer words, uh, keywords as gender studies and criticism and the professional criticism and uh, peer, you know, things like that, we didn't find more than one single academic study that actually criticized gender studies. And that's quite amazing when it has had such a strong impact, when it's discussed in the media on a daily basis, and, you know, it really permeates society, at least here in Sweden. Just as a, a, a brief digression, if I open a, a newspaper or a magazine, um, I will find, whether it's about music, it could be a military uh, magazine, it could be from the... Uh, the uh, well whatever you will find faces of uh, three or four three of out of four faces I would say on average would be female faces mm -hmm. um, and that's nothing you that's something you don't re really uh, react to probably if you haven't been studying this issue as I have when you think about well what is the base rate in this discipline in the military are 75 percent of the military uh, personnel women no not at all there are maybe 10 percent or 15 percent so it's uh, in many cases it's an unrepresentative depiction of the people who are involved in a certain domain of society and that's very interesting but it is something that Apparently, um, people are doing who who knew. Uh, I don't know how how which people make these decisions or how they are made. It could be journalists or art directors or so forth. But maybe they subconsciously um, make these decisions, or maybe they they are conscious. Maybe they feel that they are doing somehow women or society a service by promoting and. Um, yeah, promoting women also in this way, um, in, in terms of being representative. Um, sorry, I lost track. Where was I heading? Uh, well, I mean, maybe I can ask you another question also to sum up uh, mm -hmm. all of the things that we've been talking about here. So, and since you focused on 
uh, quotas, do, do quotas solve re any real problems? I mean, when politicians or, for example, college administration or something like that uh, decide to apply quotas for this or that type of job or for this or that uh, degree, uh, do, they so do they really solve any issue? Or, and on the other hand, uh, can they also create new problems or not? Well, first of all, let me be clear that we haven't applied quotas as such uh, in, the, in the strict uh, way that uh, when you have reached a certain proportion of, of uh, men, uh, the next person has to be a woman. That would be a firm quota. Uh, the only, not the only, but I know that Norway has applied this to the board of directors of companies, but it has not applied it uh, into academe. It has been suggested, uh, proposed, that the, the government in Sweden take a decision that we uh, apply some sort of quota, but that has been, those pro propositions were withdrawn because it was probably probably because it was realized that we uh, it would have no chance to be uh, reach a majority uh, in the uh, government um, if it were um, if it were voted for so what has been done instead and this is very interesting is that the the government or the depart uh, the governmental departments that uh, oversee the universities in Sweden, they have made agreements with each university, an agreement to the effect that at a certain time in the future, a certain percentage of the professors will be women. And then it's up to the uh, uh, individual institution how to reach this goal. And this is, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Because the government, have, they have this very strict uh, goal to reach at least 40, 60 in every discipline, but on average uh, 50%. They, they won't or they can't apply quotas. So instead, they say to the university, look, we give you um, a sack of money here. But you know, in order for us to do that, you have to promise us to um, that the next uh, for the next period of time this you have to employ or let's say so, uh, some of these these agreements are of the character that 60 percent of all the professors that you employ in the next two-year period have to be female And this is then um, seen in the in the light of the proportion that they have in this institution since before, so that they will uh, reach these professor these uh, these proportions, and in the light of what seems to be uh, possible. Another thing that another device that has been uh, employed is the so-called guest professor mechanism, where uh, it is now legal for a university to as they say, call a certain uh, academic to a position, to a temporary position as professor. And so they reach out to academics in Sweden or, or, uh, other, uh, or internationally and say that we invite you to be professor here for two years or so. And those professorships are to a very, very large extent uh, handed out to only to female academics. What happens then, apparently, is that, and this is not my saying, so this is, uh, this is taken from interviews with the directors of university who, uh, who, who explain, explain how they work. So when uh, this two-year period has passed, they make available means to turn this position into a permanent position. And your question was, do so, to conclude this uh, thing, I would argue that this is effectively quotas. It has exactly 
it's not exactly the same mechanism, but it has exactly the same goal, and it, it uh, has the same effects as quotas. We, we could call it something else, uh, systematic bias or whatever, but it has the same goal. And if it is the fact that we will uh, speak about in, in a short while, I think, if it is the fact that the number of women who have the same level of academic merits is actually smaller, then they have the, uh, they have a smaller population of academics that are women to choose from. And so if they want to reach the same proportion, it follows logically that the, the ability or the merits have to be somewhat lower in this group that you are trying to increase. So, can quotas solve the problem? Yeah, that's a very interesting philosophical question, and uh, I would like to take an example of where it could solve um, a problem. Say, for example, if you have some kind of knowledge that you want to gather, and the people who have this knowledge are of all different kinds, and they are dispersed. It could be knowledge about the fish in the lakes where people live, or or the deers in the forest where people live, or whatever, and you make an announcement, please come forth and uh, share the knowledge that you have in your local community. Now, if it turns out that only people in, in urban areas and not the people in the rural areas, for example, forth and share their knowledge, that is a problem because you don't get all the knowledge that you want. A quota could then be applied to uh, select people uh, statistically in all different uh, regions and uh, urge them or force them to come forth with the knowledge they have. And so you would apply um, essentially a quota to rural people uh, in uh, contrast to urban people. Another thing you might consider is if you want to have a democratic decision making that is representative of the whole population, then it might not be so good to have a parliament that is that consists of professional politicians, but you would like the parliament, if, if to represent the, po uh, the population at large, they should have basically the same demography, the same level of education, uh, the same sex, of course, the same ethnicity, uh, the same types of um, jobs as the population. Um, and therefore, that kind of quota, a, a democratic quota, would have, would have to be applied to select people from a population, the whole population of a country, for example, that is in fact representative of that population, put them into parliament and have them make the final decisions about proposals that come from the government. Now, in all those, in the, there, those are two examples that, um, that w for which quotas would apply. However, you might argue that being an academic is a matter of uh, competence, knowledge, uh, which is the product of many years or lifetime, in fact, of devoted work towards uh, reaching this level of knowledge. So it is not, unless you have an infinite pool of such people to choose from, it doesn't make very much sense to apply quota. It would make more sense to um, apply meritocratic criteria. Now, it's not obvious what those criteria should be. Uh, it's problematic to measure academic competence, of course. But here's the thing. In these policy documents that I have been reading, it, one argument that is put forth is that being an academic and being a professor in particular is a position of power in the sense that you, uh, have, you will influence many students, the students that you teach, the people you supervise, uh, and, and you will also have a stronger voice in the public debate by virtue of having this academic position. So, they make the case that 
if um, being a professor is a position of power, then that power should, according to the basic uh, propositions of equality, be equal for women and men. And therefore, uh, it's important to have an equal share of uh, female professors. So that would be one of the arguments. Other arguments that have put for, been put forth to having more women is that it creates better work environments. And I would certainly attest to that. I think it's probably a good thing for the dynamics of a, a workplace to have a, a close to equal proportion of, of women and men. I think it's many times not as nice to have a too, hard, too large proportion of men or women. Another argument that has been put forth is that the productivity of organizations increase when there is diversity in the workforce. And that's a whole issue in and of itself. If we uh, constrain ourselves to diversity in terms of, of sex, I have been actually looking into that literature, which isn't that large, and I cannot find any empirical evidence that there is a causal effect, at least, um, between a equal proportion of men and women and higher productivity of an organization. So, to be careful, there is at least no empirical evidence that that would be the case. So, um, yet another argument that has been put forth in this debate is that people, academics and teachers, act as role models. Uh, somehow, if you see um, a person, a su successful person who is male, you might think that um, if you're a male yourself, you might think that I can become that person. But if you're a, a woman, you might think that since all successful people I see around me are male, I can probably not reach that uh, mm -hmm. level of success for, for some reason. And so it is often argued in the gender studies uh, publications as well that is 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 profoundly important that women have female role models mm -hmm. uh, in their uh, in their work and, and study environment. And uh, another argument is influence in general. The higher the level of academe, the more influence people are assumed to have. They sit in more committees, they will be examinators, uh, they will uh, judge the um, scientific quality of dissertations, of funding applications, and they will also have an influence over funding. And this, I think, is a key question, really, that there is a, a most of research, or a lot of research in Sweden is done with uh, public funding that comes from the government in one way or another. And to a large extent, it is academics, but also politicians that decide which academics uh, get access to this funding. And again, the argument is then, of course, that if a higher proportion, if a majority of these people are male, that might disadvantage female academics. And that's a, that is an empirical question, and it's a fair question. And it has been uh, subject to a great deal, actually, of empirical scrutiny. And I have summarized, reviewed this literature in some, to some extent in, in my articles, but there seems to be no evidence that this is the case. There is no evidence of homophily, so to speak, uh, that um, people tend very tend to favor their own sex mm -hmm. to any greater extent. There are some systematic effects of of sex when uh, they are when committees make decisions, but they are not in the direction that males tend to favor males and females tend to favor females. Uh, that general mechanism doesn't seem to apply, at least not in the academic context. But 
but one general um, tendency that there is is that people tend to favor the less represented sex, mm -hmm. both women and, and men. So in computer science, for example, um, there is a, a bias to hire more women. Uh, I'm not sure about other disciplines that are um, have have a majority of, of women, but yeah. So it, so to sum up, it it turns out that many of these as basic assumptions that lie behind the gender integration that is called this huge operation, as I mentioned before, and that lies behind the assumptions of gender studies and also the arguments for um, for increasing the gender equality, they seem not to have ve um, very much empirical support, basically. So, but it is, of course, striking. I mean, it's surprising and striking that yet today, 75, 70 to 75% of professors in Sweden are male. And if we are, uh, before we begin to to do anything about that, I think it's very important to, to find out what is the causes. I mean, if we really want to put in, we have already put in lots of effort into, into increasing the quality. And in fact, it has borne out in the, in the sense that the proportion of, of uh, professors has increased from about 15% 30, 40 years ago to um, almost 30% today. So there has been a huge increase in the proportion of, of women. And if we assume that that increase is maybe due to the general um, uh, movement of women into the professional sector and into academe, uh, as reflected by 60% uh, women on, on, as freshmen, then we would expect that this will continue to uh, trend in the same direction for uh, a large number of years. When these 60% uh, that um, are students today, when they, uh, when they get their PhDs in, in seven years or so, uh, May, maybe there there will be um, maybe there will be seven or or eight women for every um, ten people who apply for a position in academe. So maybe um, it's just a a matter of historical change due to the technical and whatever uh, social changes that are occurring in society. That's one possibility. Another possibility is, of course, that it is the active work um, from politicians and, and gender studies um, scholars that has uh, increased the proportion of women. We don't know. But as it hasn't yet reached, uh, led to 50 percent, we should really, really ask ourselves, what are the um, causes for this difference and um, and there's a whole there's a whole area of science that are looking in, that is looking into these questions um, but but gender studies scholars are not at all interested in any other explanations uh, I mean possible explanations would be based in evolutionary psychology for example in biological differences of various kinds and we know that there are personality differences and there are differences in interest and we also there is also some uh, rather strong indications that these are um, biologically based in the in the sense that we can detect them early on as you uh, as you well know so um, we wouldn't have had to ask ourselves these questions if it hadn't been for the politicians' insistence that this is a problem and we have to change this. We could have approached this phenomenon in, in different ways. Now we have approached it from a outcome-centered way where we have decided that the, it's 
it's desirable to have an equal proportion. And we have t- took all kinds of, you know, a wide, wide range of measures to make it so. But a different approach could have been to simply ask, why is this? Why is this proportion so different? How much uh, of that difference can be accounted for by historical reasons that are now changing anyway, by biological uh, factors that we may uh, not be able to change that much, and by social factors. And social factors is the thing that the gender studies perspective has focused entirely upon. And that's also a philosophical decision and a perspective to what extent does really these social factors um, exert a causal uh, a causal effect? Um, are, th- are they causal, generally? Myself, um, having looked at a lot of this research, I tend to think that many of the social structures, as it were, the attitudes and the expectations that we have and so forth, are more based on what really is, what really is the case. I mean, what what is common, we tend to, um, right? What is uncommon, we tend not, not to think uh, is so very likely. And the wonderful thing about Western societies is that we, we are really striving to to relieve ourselves of these strong expectations, we have really uh, generally um, the attitude that each individual should be able to pursue uh, their own interests and and uh, develop their potential. That's uh, a basic fundament of the kind of individualism that is present in Western societies. And that is kind of um, um, thwarted by this perspective that is applied by the gender studies because it no longer uh, focuses on the individual but on the group um, identity and the group uh, membership. And I think, so <laughs> this is this is was, a, was a kind of a, a circum vented way of, of returning back to the issue of what is it really that we want to achieve. Um, <clears throat> and that is, I think, what is most interesting of all, what we really want to see as the end result. Obviously, there are very few people who want to see some kind of um, some kind of steering or uh, we basically what we want to have is the possible amount of freedom for each individual and freedom to to thrive in society. And I think that <clears throat> what we have seen in the past decades is that looking at people as members of groups out from their defining features as their sex and skin color and so forth is not at all favoring this perspective, but is rather acting to lock people into certain, to exclude certain possibilities, to lock them into um, prejudices, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let let us uh, let's just explore one last topic here. And since you mentioned that it is very important for us to try to understand the causes underlying the sex differences, particularly in occup in professional occupations and in academia at the at different levels, uh, do do you think that uh, these uh, studies that have been coming out, particularly since I think 2017 or 2018, where people study the gender equality paradox, that is, they collect data from men and women from several different countries. There are studies that in- include tens or hundreds of thousands of thousands of people. Um, 
and they arrive at the conclusion and this happens systematically and people <coughs> have already done meta-analysis I think and it happen, happens systematically that they find that as people go from uh, societies that are uh, that are not Western, that are more collectivistic, that are poorer societies that give people less opportunity to societies that are more uh, gender equal and the, where people have more opportunity to study and to uh, move and to have an occupation that is more of their liking that the sex differences, at least in terms of some occupations and some uh, educational preferences and even personality traits increase. And, uh, the and there are many researchers that interpret those results as saying that um, as, uh, as we remove some, uh, some social, political, economic obstacles, then the aspects of uh, men's and women's psychology that are somewhat, that are innate at least to some extent, uh, manifest themselves and people are more able to express uh, their preferences. And so that would be why we get, uh, as we move from less gender equal to more gender equal countries, those differences increase. Do, do you think that that's a good explanation? I don't know if you are too much into that sort of area, that kind of studies or, or not. So. Yeah, I've, I've been working with such data as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I recently visited a dissertation uh, where there was a huge study of that kind uh, looking into uh, differences in, in memory performance between women and men. Yeah. And um, yes, the, these uh, studies are, are ve very compelling where you can make these cross-cultural comparisons. Um, I would assume that it's not gender equality per se that is the most important underlying factor, but wealth. Um, wealth. wealth, security, and and technical uh, level of development, all which give people the latitude to um, to live out their uh, desires. I mean, in a poor country, uh, you have you, you may have to take the job you, you can get, whether it's as as a car, auto mechanic or or professor in, in physics or even if you are not so interested in the topic itself. Or, but um, these are uh, definitely the case that uh, more freedom to choose make uh, sex differences, uh, assuming there is uh, exist sex differences, to, to express themselves in, in different ways. And, uh, but it's probably a, a lot of more, lot more complicated than that because there are different ways of expressing this uh, too. Uh, for example, in Sweden, we have a, a very large um, public sector, which includes uh, a lot of, you know, everything from culture to, um, of course, academic. Uh, academia is entirely funded uh, from from the public sector. Uh, and all kinds of projects and uh, social projects, many things that are financed by taxpayers' money to improve conditions in society. And what you can note is that these, the jobs that are created in the sector, um, they uh, um, constitute opportunities that doesn't exist in other countries, in countries with a, a smaller public sector. And so um, the kinds of, many of the kinds of things that are done in, in those occupations wouldn't be done at all. And uh, I think that is probably a, an interesting um, area for discovering what people 
really put their efforts into when they actually have the latitude to do so. I mean, I'm talking about things that actually do not produce any economic value. Uh, and uh, that makes a difference. And that, that, I mean, that's the problem with academia as well. Most of what is done within academia is not directly productive in, in the corporate sense and therefore has to be funded by public means if we are to have a free um, inquiry and um, have the uh, and foster the possibilities to make all these kinds of fluke um, discoveries that have led to the great uh, you know, the great uh, improvements of, of science and so forth. Um, but um, you were talking about also uh, problems with quotas, and that is, of course, that. Um, the thing we re we have been talking a bit, a bit about uh, <laughs> what, what is anger, this anger and this level of conflict that uh, this has led to, where um, gender studies have, I mean, this is again not me saying this, but, but there's a slew of people who have uh, made these observations and ma made these claims that gender studies tend to isolate themselves from their mother disciplines and to become, in a way, uh, a filter bubble, an echo chamber, if you want to um, exaggerate it a bit, uh, in which you can uh, exclude many uh, different areas of knowledge, just simply don't mention it. Because, so, in gender studies, mm, biological levels of explanation are, uh, explanations are not even mentioned. And so when other people uh, hear this and see this, they react and say, this is very, very strange. What about this and that and the other area? <laughs> so, and, and the gender studies people might be inclined to, they haven't even heard about this perhaps. And, and they might just dismiss it as, um, old-fashioned stuff, uh, they don't know so much about it, they can't say very much about it. And at this level of abstract, uh, this high abstract level, th it's very easy for people to be coming into conflict with each other. They don't even share the basic knowledge or the basic concrete uh, stuff that goes into these issues. And that's a huge problem that causes conflicts at universities and I would argue that we have to look out for this uh, where it affects the students as well. We, we are making, there's a risk that we make uh, students a, a huge disservice by putting them into an environment where there is this hostile and uh, level of debate which um, it's not conducive to uh, uh, a good learning environment. So that's one problem with quotas itself, because because quotas put the focus on in, uh, sex in this case, and people start to observe this. Oh, look, my fellow students, they are male or they are female, and they behave somewhat differently. That has to do with the, with the patriarchy. Uh, look, these teachers are male, these teachers are female, why is that? Why are there so few women or why are there so few men here? It's, it's constantly causing um, conflict and, uh, yeah, and controversy. So that's one of, of the bad things about this whole focus, that it creates problems for, for students. And it's also, uh, so to be embroiled in these group conflicts, I think, is, is uh, very unfortunate. And it also is bad for the work environment at universities, where these issues are, again, uh, causing controversy amongst the staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me just ask you one last question, particularly since we started by talking about gender studies and some of the problems and limitations that they have and methodological problems, particularly. 
how, how do you think people could improve the study of gender and gender differences and where they stem from and things like that? Yeah. Well, first of all, we can note that when we looked at our whole material of more than 1,000 publications, um, a, a, a fairly small proportion of those publications were actually empirical. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's qu quite an un astounding fact that when you, a typical um, publication in, in medicine or, or physics or psych even psychology would tend to contain some, some sort of data, whether it's primary data or secondary data, uh, gleaned from registers or whatever. But the majority of, of gender studies publications in our sample, which is representative, they are not even empirical. But they, um, th what are they? They are theoretical. They discuss concepts. Uh, they discuss values um, and things like that. So, say, and of course, there's, a, there's definitely a place for theoretical papers in all disciplines. There's no question of that. But there is a risk if the proportion becomes very much uh, larger than, than 50% that it doesn't contrib contribute with that much new. The creation of knowledge requires to some, uh, to a considerable extent that we go to the, the world out there and gather some data and make some ob observations. Otherwise, there's a risk that it will be just um, a self-perpetuating uh, slew of arguments. So that is one thing that one should look out for. Another thing is the, um, the general scientific methods. We, we did, um, I'm sure we haven't time to go into this in any detail, but what we tried to do in our studies was to look at some generally um, agreed upon criteria for what is high quality in, in science. And one is, for example, to, to provide arguments for the statements you make. Often wise you do that uh, with, with a logical argument or by citing some study that supports what you uh, claim. And we, we measured that uh, mechanically in our publications and found that the this level of argument support, as we may call it, was uh, substantially lower in gender in in publications with a gender studies perspective as those w without gender studies perspective, where the support was about high support was um, about present in about seventy percent of all statements in the papers, whereas it was I think around 30% in the gender studies uh, publications. <clears throat> and uh, so it seems that either has gender studies, you know, focused on a few um, methods from certain disciplines, or they have developed a set of methods or practices uh, themselves that has been less favorable because, uh, I mean, these are criteria the academics, and I think, uh, I'm pretty sure even gender scholars agree upon that these are desirable features. Um, we studied um, some, you know, two dozen of different indicators of scientific quality, and many of them, more than half of them, um, had lower values in the gender studies perspective publications. And um, so it's very important that um, if, if, if to make a change, if to have a, a continued high impact, I, I think they sh gender studies should um, be more open to established methods. Uh, now this reminds me of something that also emerged in the in the gender studies, no, in not the gender studies, but the gender perspective courses I part took in, namely that 
um, gender studies is by some scholars claimed to be uh, a new and, and a better type of science. It's an improved science that supersedes the old established ways of doing science. And, and in some of the um, criticism that we got from our empirical papers, this line of reasoning occurred. So, but what is the consequences of that? Is it perhaps, as you would inf infer from this criticism, that gender studies cannot and should not be held to the same standards as other areas of science? Well, you could make that claim, but then you, could al you should also be able to show that, um, that it is indeed uh, superior in some sense. That if we apply uh, other methods, say, um, to a larger extent, qualitative methods or phenomenological methods, then we reach other kinds of knowledge or that we, uh, that, than that we could with, with the other methods, or we reach a better, stronger knowledge, more representative knowledge. Well, if, um, we haven't seen that yet, but if you could show that, you could certainly make a case uh, that um, indeed, gender studies has to be evaluated by people who are gender studies scholars, for example. So that's one one line of um, that's one kind of argument that you can infer from criticisms that we have gotten that we are not competent to evaluate gender studies because we are not gender study, studies scholars ourselves. You have to be that to really understand it uh, to the extent that you can evaluate it. And um, fine, that's a, that's a nice argument, and we should test that argument. And I'm all all for testing that. But as far as we have uh, worked with these studies so far, it is to assume that they have the same um, basic goals and uh, apply apply the same basic standards. And in those respects, they have been doing relatively poorly. So um, that complicates sort of the response to your question. On the one hand, if we uh, should consider gender studies as a science, as any other science, judged by the same criteria, then it would be good for gender studies to improve uh, these quality measures. And uh, there, we can't get into those details, but it's it's well known what, what those are. and. On the other hand, if we find that they should be held to a different standard, uh, they have to make it clear what that standard is and what are the benefits of applying this different standard. Yeah, so uh, really just before we go, let me just ask one question, because I know that you've also studied some uh, psychological sex differences. Uh, uh, the, the, the ones that you've studied and probably others that you know about, do you think that if they are at least to some extent innate or genetically based, uh, to, to what extent do you think that we can move into societies that are, that would be at least considered by people who have the kind of ideology that we've been talking about uh, more gender equal. I mean, do you think that some of those traits can be more malleable than they have been with the with the approaches that people around the world have been uh, have been put into place or not? Well, the tr the traits themselves. Um... This is a whole different discussion. Um, the the impact, of, it's a fascinating area, uh, and I don't think we have time to, to make it any justice, but let me just say that it's entirely possible that there are psychological innate, as you say, sex differences that explain part of this. Uh, that being said, it is also quite possible that these uh, differences can be compensated for or thwarted 
in such a way that we arrive at um, equality in outcomes. And this is um, you know, one of the very, very central issues um, in, ho in, in the whole of this debate uh, is, is um, equality in opportunity the thing or is it equality of outcome and uh, that's a hard uh, thing to crack for the social sciences I think um, yeah. we are we are struggling with that but let's turn the reasoning the other way somehow. Let's just assume, we've been into some of the questions of why it might be good to have equal proportions of men, men and women. Let's assume that these are valid points and that it's, it has some good consequences to reach equality. Now, how much do we have to um, uh, twist people's arms, so to speak, to become, to make more gender equal choices? That's the question. Do we have to hold, do we have to force people to some extent or lure people into choosing uh, professions and educations that uh, may, may not be historically typical of their sex? We can do that. People are extremely malleable, and there are different levels of force. We are now, at present, we are applying a certain level of social force, no doubt. Um, as in the example I mentioned to you with the magazines that uh, overrepresent women to a great extent, that is one just one um, reflection of a underlying agenda that we have as a society, as a culture, uh, to improve conditions for women and for minorities in general. And um, we will always... So this means that we are actually already now performing a social uh, engineering effort on people. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it does work to some extent, it does have effects. Uh, it does have effects in the desired direction that people, um, they adopt these perspectives and they do work more to um, increase the uh, representation of women in, in certain areas. We see this the, the, in the research literature as well, where Ceci and Vil Williams document a very strong favoritism of women in the STEM sciences, for example. So there's no question that this cultural movement has had an effect in, in, in that direction. But that means that it must also reasonably have some kind of reactive effect in the opposite direction, uh, where my work is one example where I take what is being said to me at face value and I simply say oh that's interesting let's test it let's see if it's true and many other people will will do this and are, and are doing this and uh, the question is if uh, what it will lead to in a few years some kind of backlash some kind of increased conflict perhaps I hope that it will lead to more knowledge because as an academic that is what I want to see and I uh, I would hope that this knowledge that we gather together uh, from from all different strands of, of academe uh, that we also share that knowledge amongst ourselves and not keep it within certain ideological or academic realms <sighs> yeah um, so yeah, was that answer to your question? I may have missed the point. Uh, no, 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 that, that, that's perfectly okay. So, and Dr. Madison, we've already covered a lot of topics here today, so we should probably end the interview here. But just before we go, like last time, would you like to mention what are the best places on the internet for people to find your work? 
Yes, in this case, it's very clear. It is uh, these uh, six different articles that we have been alluding to. Um, the, the latest one is published in the Studies of Higher Education. It's the one you mentioned about the professors. The previous one is uh, about the, it's called the explications of politicians' uh, arguments for gender quotas, I think. It's, it's, Basically, the title is published in uh, Frontiers in uh, Communication uh, and Open Source. So both of these papers are available as open access. And then the, the previous four publications, um, they are found in uh, Scientometrics, uh, a, a journal devoted to, to bibliometrical studies. But I have to also mention the, the most recent paper because it is, is, if you look at the equality, sex equality in, in academe, it is the case over, across the board that men are more productive. They publish more papers and publish more papers in higher uh, impact journals and so forth. And that can, of course, be attributed to this sex discrimination uh, against women. So one, one way to really eliminate this possible cause and to look if, um, to look at the meritocratic selection itself, we did something that no study before has done. And that is namely to look at the specific position in an academic's career when they are promoted to tenured professor. At that point in the career, if the system is working, uh, if, the, uh, if the system is equal, then um, the, it's not important whether it's 50% women or men, but what is important is that people who are appointed to become professors, they have the same academic merits, whether they are women or men. So uh, the, the basic reasoning is that according to this whole idea that uh, women are disfavored, then the few women that finally pass the, the bar, so to speak, and are finally appointed to become professors, they would have higher academic merits than the men who are appointed to the same academic level, if in fact there is discrimination uh, against women. Uh, what we found were substantial differences in the other direction, uh, so, such that the women that are now being promoted to full professors in Sweden, they have lesser academic merits, lower academic merits than, than the men. So this seems to point to discrimination against males. That's one possibility. That the people or the, the committees that are selecting people when they apply for professorships, they are in fact biased against men. That is one explanation. Uh, and we don't know what the explanation is. Another explanation could be that more women are coming into the system uh, uh, at different routes, as we were talking about before, with uh, th one example being the guest professors. Um, but that is one obvious um, follow-up that should be done to this study because the study is sort of alarming in showing that today, I mean, the consequence of this empirical result showing that men have, in some disciplines, 200% more uh, public, uh, publications or citations, uh, very, very high differences it would seem to suggest that when students meet a female professor in the future, they tend to meet a person who has lower academic merits. Mm -hmm. And that is, that would be an unhappy thing. Uh, that is, that goes against the basic uh, academic principles to uh, select the best amongst the peers for the most demanding uh, positions. So uh, with that said, I think that these, um, the, the, these articles, they give 
the whole story of what we've been talking about today, uh, but a considerable more uh, level of detail, and also, which I found particularly interesting, insight and many long quotes from the historical, um, um, the, from the history of this whole uh, phenomenon, where you will find uh, uh, quotes from, as I said, from uh, uh, government reports and such things that show how uh, politicians have been reasoning for a long time. They say, for example, in uh, in these reports that uh, sex is uh, is a social construction, or the Nordic view is that sex is uh, uh, not something biological. It says that. Um, Masculinity is something that is malleable and can be uh, changed. And they say that it's, uh, that the goal is that women and men should have equal power and influence in all domains of society. So that is something to think about, uh, really, what, what is the best uh, route forward for a a just and fair society, a just and fair academe, um, and for a a situation where all people can feel free and able to, as possible, as much as, much as possible, pursue their own interests and their own, own inclinations. Uh, and that is what I am for, and I I would really like people to just you know. Uh, Take a look here and there in these pa papers and, and uh, to find these examples and um, put their own thoughts to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Madison, let's end on that note. And again, it was really an immense pleasure to have you again on the show. And thank you so much for your time. You've been very generous, particularly today. And uh, I hope that someday we can do another conversation, probably on the topics of your work that we haven't explored that much uh, about the, the sex differences that you've studied specifically. But let's yes. see. Let's see. And anyway, thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke, and Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klimpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, 
and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.